Coedigian, or um, uh, as the maps used to call it, Cardiganshire, um, uh, Mid Wales, uh, the middle of nowhere, I mean, it really is. Uh, I took the title of this talk is um, from uh, uh, this television series, which I hope many of you have seen. Um, it's, uh, it's filmed in the area, filmed, filmed around uh, Aberystwyth, uh, the, the hills around there. Um, and it's, uh, it's a series that take, it's a detective series that takes its uh, inspiration and style from the Scandi Noir, Nordic Noir, um, uh, 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 sort of thrillers. <coughs> so it's very much creating a landscape which is full of open skies and isolated farmhouses, family feuds, incredibly complex and sometimes negative social relationships running back over years. Um, very much tied to a particular place um, and it does capture something about the, the nature of life in, in rural Ceredigion. Um, it is slightly fictionalised of course, um, the crime rates come, crime rates a bit, <laughs> a bit lower in reality than, than it is on this, a murder a week, um, but, uh, um, but it, does, it, it genuinely captures something about sort of the, the nature of these landscapes. And uh, the particular place, oh, I'm be lucky I didn't put that in the title. A Pompey Fendigai, or as everybody calls it, Bont, um, uh, is a, a small nucleated village um, uh, on the edge of the Cambrian Mountains. Um, it has medieval origins, but it owes its current size and, and appearance to uh, 19th century lead mining uh, when this was. Okay, as we keep on hearing, this is a rural place that was an industrial place. Um, and you can see the miners' housings there looking very similar to the, uh, the ones that Paul showed earlier um, down in South Wales. So it's a small, small community, so 400 people live here. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is how that community sees heritage and interacts with the heritage that's out there. Um, and uh, what was going to be a surprise, it isn't now. <laughs> <laughs> is Laura Jane Smith's concept of authorised heritage discourse, which I found incredibly useful in trying to analyse um, sort of the, the, the relationship between between a, a community and, and, and its heritage, because this isn't um, just straightforwardly a power relationship. It's not a question of the people with the power deciding what what is important or what is significant um, in terms of ascribing value. Um, it's very much negotiated between a series of different players. Um, in order to reach some sort of broad social consensus about what is important or of or, 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 or value. And uh, you can see there's a bit there about social consensus. There is a line there for ordinary people, if you like, to have a say. And that's really brought out by, in the Faroe Convention um, way where they talk about the heritage community as a, a group of people with a shared interest in the protection and development of a particular part of heritage which is a combination of experts having their say and the people who live there primarily, well, the people um, having their say too. So in terms of the authorised heritage discourse for, for, for the area, it's quite clear where the importance is. Um, this is uh, Strata Florida Abbey, which is literally a mile away from the village. Um, it is... Uh, as far as sort of the state's concerned, this is really important. We know that because it was one of the first scheduled monuments in Wales to be designated. It's a grade one listed building as well as being scheduled. Um, it's one of the hundred odd sites that CADU, uh, Welsh Historic Monuments, has it in its guardianship and actually operates as a, as a, a, a paid heritage site. So the state thinks it's important. Academics think it's important too. Um, and now if you know anything about monastic archaeology you'll know that Cistercians are the rock stars, everybody loves them, um, uh, and this is Cistercian Abbey. So, um, so in general they've been studied and specifically the university's been doing research on the site for years. Um, so there's a very clear academic thing saying yes this is important. There's also a political strand to why it's considered to be an important site. Um, it's one of the few high-profile sites, which is firmly relating to the Welsh princes rather than the invading Normans. 
So there's a very strong there's a, there's a reference to nation building in um, Smith, Smith's definition, and there's a very strong nationalist attachment to this site because of its association with the Welsh princes. And there's also another dimension to it in terms of the Welsh language that the scriptorium at Sparta, Florida um, was one the, the most active in Wales and most of what we now know as medieval Welsh literature was copied here. And so therefore there's, there's all these strands of importance saying yes, this is a really important site. And so um, uh, for a couple of years I was working on this, this project where we were deliberately trying to um, uh, in a very pragmatic way, this is, this is uh, e economic development money. What we were trying to do was trying to e encourage the use of the tourism potential of the site in order to benefit the local community. And uh, part of that was actually talking to the community and trying to get them to engage with, with the heritage that's on their doorstep, alongside various other activities. And so when we did the community engagement, we ran a whole series of uh, outreach events and activities to try, to try basically to try and get them to come to the site and understand why it was important so they could then become ambassadors to tell everybody else why it was important. And we really struggled with this. Um, we knew this as we starting off. So for example, the, the baseline survey there, I did a survey of all the visitors who came to the site <coughs> on one day. And it's quite, actually quite typical that more people were making a 100 mile round trip a hundred mile one direction trip from England to visit the site than came up the road from the village. Um, that's quite typical. Basically, the people in the village never came to the site, they weren't particularly interested in it. And even though when we, when we ran our events, we tried to broaden them away from saying, it's, oh, no, it's not just archaeology, it's not, you know, recognising that that doesn't appeal to everyone. We tried to broaden what we were offering so there was art events, classes, craft activities, um, fun and game, all sorts of stuff. Um, even so, they stayed away in their droves, as they say. Um, and that was, a, that was a big challenge. And anyway, sort of fact, you know, this paper really is the result of my reflection over time about whether we did the wrong things or did them the wrong way. Um, you know, basically, if we could try harder, it would have worked um, or not. And I think we sort of realised really that when we were starting for this, we were starting from a a slightly naive viewpoint. We took the sort of field of dreams approach that if we build it, they will come. If we tell them it's exciting, they'll recognise it's exciting and sort of basically agree with us. And that didn't work. Um, so using the idea of the, 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 uh, the, the, the authorised territories discourse, thinking about trying to pick that apart. And one of the interesting things that Smith says is one of the issues about when people talk about community is they talk about that in essentialising that as if the community is one blob, one collection of people who share the same interests and therefore can be reached through the same mechanisms. And although this is a small, small community, it's actually got a whole multiple sets of different identities and aspects. So when we talk about a community, it's actually a whole nest of, of interlocking communities, different interest groups, um, and you can see that I'm not, these aren't necessarily in conflict, although some of them are, the Women's Institute and the Merkid Awar, which is the Welsh language equivalent, are, are daggers drawn. You have, to choose, you have to choose which side you're on. You can't be in both. Um. But, you know, you, you, know, you can see, we you know, if there's all these different, different aspects of the community, then it's, it's hardly likely that any, that any one, one approach is going to hit them all. And in fact, I've just put in bold the ones, the ones that we would tend to hit, and if you look at that, it's quite interesting that this demographic is exactly the demographic that basically all heritage hits. This is, this is, this is, these are the people, the old middle class people, who are English, you know, Anglicans, they are the same people who, well, they, they see, consider the authorised heritage discourse, the official version, as being the sort of history that, that they like. Um, and that <coughs> everybody else is left behind. And so, yeah, so, so thinking about this, thinking, well, okay, well, why, why didn't we get the right people turning up or get enough people turning up? Um, and basically, one, one answer is that they were turning away from what we had to offer in terms of, in terms of heritage. 
that they weren't interested. I think it's, it's not that they weren't told, it's genuinely that they weren't interested. Um, but it's not true that they, would, they had no interest in heritage at all, because there are actually aspects of, of the heritage that they were perfectly happy to engage with. So, for example, we have the uh, slightly surreal photograph up there, is the, is the an, an annual Life Stedford uh, Arts, and, uh, Arts and Culture um, Festival competition. So it's been running locally, no, no outward involvement, no outside involvement. They just sort of organised it themselves, they're very happy with it. Um, so that they're quite happy to engage on that basis. And then on the, the far side there, you've got the gravestones. But there's a tradition in Wales on Palm Sunday, or Seal of Lodi, Flower Sunday, as it's called in Wales. Um, there's a tradition that families visit all of their family graves, clean the gravestones, and leave flowers ready for Easter. So they're, they're going out and interacting with bits of the past, but not the ones that we, that we told them to. Down the bottom here, this slightly, this slightly known slice, but these, what these stone slabs are doing are covering up the outlet of a spring, which is in a valley called um, Duffin Tower, the Quiet Valley. Um, and this is a, a lot, there's a long tradition there of holy wells and healing wells. Um, but this, is, this, is, this isn't one of those, it just is an outlet that looks a bit mysterious. Um, but that's actually been adopted by local pagans, and so there's quite often candles and offerings left there. Um, it's a place of some sort of cultural practice associated um, with the landscape. Then on the far side, that yew tree is supposed to represent the burial place of Dagobah Willem, who is the most important uh, Welsh language poet um, of the medieval period. Um, if you talk to historians and archaeologists, um, they would say categorically, well, certainly that tree isn't the right one, um, even though it may be roughly in the right place. But this is something, again, where people genuinely come for pilgrimage, they come to visit this grave um, and uh, the candles and flowers, again. Um, so that, that people are quite happy to interact with bits of the heritage um, if, they, if, they, if, if it appeals to them. And so there's a possibility that we can actually um, exploit the power, the sort of things that appeal to, to the, the unauthorised heritage in order to um, basically sort of meet, 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 meet communities halfway. Um, so, for example, this is the, this is, say, semi-authorised heritage. Um, the Nantios Cup, what it actually is, you can see at the top there, is a medieval wooden bowl. Um, but the story is that this was actually brought by monks from Glastonbury Abbey to Strata Florida Abbey, just at the period of the dissolution. It was brought over for safekeeping, they then, then get sent up in the ownership of the people of Nantios House, who owned, who owned the uh, uh, post dissolution lands. And this is supposed to be the Holy Grail. Um, now, that's a story that has, well, again, if you, if you ask, ask someone about the truth of that story, then you say, well, it's probably not true. Um, but it is more interesting and appealing than. Uh, a lot of the other things that we try and convince people to be excited by. And again, sort of, uh, in terms of, uh, sort of creating a cultural um, object, um, as part of the, one of our open days, we commissioned a series of site specific sculptures, um, including this one, which is a three metre high statue called The Pilgrim uh, by Glenn Morris. Um, and you can see it's on the hill just above the, the iconic arch. Um, and so this was built, it was intended to be there for two weeks, and that's it's, it's a bit like the, uh, the sheds we were hearing about this morning. It was supposed to be there for two weeks, but actually everybody liked it so much, we left it there. Um, and it has become instantly accepted by the community as being an attractive landmark. So they, they enjoyed it um, in a way that they didn't enjoy, perhaps the sort of the archway down there. Um, and it's become an icon, as you can see, it's been used on a book cover there to represent Keridivian. Uh, this is something that didn't exist five years ago, um, but it's been, it, it, universally been adopted as being part of the cultural meaning um, of, of being, being in Keridivian. So that offers some, some possibility for saying, okay, well, if, if we want to engage with heritage, well, basically, do we want to try and include communities in our authorised heritage discourse, like, you know, by giving them more opportunity to, to, to 
control the content of it? Um, alternatively, do we look at what they're interested in and think about whether there, there is some way to give greater recognition um, to, to those unauthorised bits, say, well, this is, these people are living cultural lives, can, can we somehow um, recognise that, um, rather than be just the latest in a long line of people who've come in from outside and told them what they ought to do. So, what to, 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 to summarise, yeah, basically, yeah, they've got an issue that the, certainly our current authorised heritage discourse um, makes no real attempt to include the voice of communities um, in deciding what is important and what ought to be done. Um, community or communities, they have complex attitudes and social relations, um, and, we, and if, we, if we ignore that, then we'll end up just serving the same audience, however big or small it is. One thing I'd say is, that in a rural context, it's very, very clear when you get that challenging de demographic I mentioned earlier, because we know that there, if there's only 10 people meeting that criteria in our community, then and only those 10 people will turn up. If we've run the equivalent exercises in an ur urban space, we, would still, we might still have been just as exclusive in terms of the type of people we were reaching, but we'd be patting ourselves on the back, on, on the back because we've got 200 people turning up. But if it's in, a, say, if it's in Swansea where you've got sort of 200,000 people to choose from, it's still a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, but the same, sort of, it's, it's very obvious in a rural context when you, when you succeed and when you fail. And so an interesting strand putting together these unauthorised heritage discourse activities is that they all involve actually going and doing something specific. So it's not just, oh yes, that's an interesting fact about the Welsh language. It's actually being involved. There, there's an element of going and doing stuff um, and doing it repeatedly. These are all annual things. Well, apparently, uh, I say the, uh, the pagan use of the, of the spring site is, is completely undocumented. Um, we just noticed it because uh, we were doing some survey work in the area and realised that these things were magically appearing. Oh, magically. <laughs> um, but I say that there is a potential if we're being very pragmatic and say we want people to engage with heritage, then maybe the, the path is rather than to start from saying this is important, but can we say, can we find areas where we're halfway in between? There are interesting things to say. Can we use those interesting things in order to present our heritage agenda? And um, the, the project has moved on. I mean, obviously, this is, this is a short period of funding, but um, it's actually now moving into the next stage of building a big heritage centre. And because we're looking for HLF money, uh, we keep on being asked how we're we getting the community involved. And so um, they've now been very much built into the development of the site, rather than just being seen as being a sort of sheep, basically, that we needed to get on site so we could, we could uh, um, do what we wanted. Thank you very much. Thank you.